the letter to Diognetus was written around A.D. 125 or earlier. The author is unknown to us. He said about himself, I do not speak things strange to me, nor do I aim at anything inconsistent with right reason. But having been a disciple of the apostles, I have become a teacher of the Gentiles. Because of the author's extremely close connection with the apostles themselves, the value of this letter cannot be overstated. Many scholars give the author the name Mathetes, which is a transliteration of the Greek word for disciple. As for the recipient, Diognetus, he is also unknown to us. The spirit and message of the letter is similar to that of Paul's letters. It is very possible that the author was a student of the Apostle Paul. The letter's wording and tone suggest that it may have been written during the time of the Apostles, so it is possible that the letter was written much earlier than A.D. 125. The letter to Diognetus is a fantastic read. In it, the author addresses many things including the folly of pagan idols and Jewish observances, the characteristics of a Christian, and the role of Jesus Christ in his relation to the Father and forgiving our sins. Here are some powerful passages taken from the letter about the characteristics of a Christian. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They beget children but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men, and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death, and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, and yet abound in all. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are spoken of as evil, and yet are justified. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted, and they repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. And do not wonder that a man may become an imitator of God. He can, if he is willing. For it is not by ruling over his neighbors or by seeking to hold supremacy over those that are weaker or by being rich and showing violence towards those that are inferior. Nor can anyone by these things become an imitator of God. These things do not at all constitute His majesty. On the contrary, he who takes upon himself the burden of his neighbor, he who in whatsoever respect he may be superior, is ready to benefit another who is deficient. He who, whatsoever things he has received from God, by distributing these to the needy, he is an imitator of God. Marcianus Aristides lived in Athens, Greece, around A.D. 125. He is not to be confused with Aristides the Just, an official of Athens, around 480 B.C. Aristides was a philosopher both before and after he became a Christian. His main work was written to Emperor Hadrian, which is now called the Apology of Aristides. Aristides didn't write this because he was sorry about something. An apology is a writing or speech that defends a position, in this case Christianity. In it, he contrasts Christianity with other religions of that day. He explains Jesus, including his virgin birth, death, resurrection, and ascension. Aristides also describes the character of Jesus' followers, the Christians. We did not have the complete version of his apology until it was found in St. Catherine's Monastery in 1889. Sadly, none of his other works have survived in their entirety 
or are completely lost. Here is Aristide's account of the gospel and the spread of Christianity. The Christians then trace the beginning of their religion from Jesus the Messiah, and he is named the Son of God Most High. And it is said that God came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin assumed and clothed himself with flesh, and the Son of God lived in a daughter of man. This is taught in the gospel, as it is called, which a short time ago was preached among them, and you also, if you will read therein, may perceive the power which belongs to it. This Jesus, then, was born of the race of the Hebrews, and he had twelve disciples, in order that the purpose of his incarnation might in time be accomplished. But he himself was pierced by the Jews, and he died and was buried. And they say that after three days he rose, and ascended to heaven. Thereupon these twelve disciples went forth throughout the known parts of the world, and kept showing his greatness with all modesty and uprightness. And hence also those of the present day who believe that preaching are called Christians, and they have become famous. Here is what Aristide says about the nature of God. I say then that God is not born, not made, an ever-abiding nature without beginning and without end, immortal, perfect, and incomprehensible. Now when I say that he is perfect, this means that there is not in him any defect, and he is not in need of anything, but all things are in need of him. And when I say that he is without beginning, this means that everything which has beginning has also an end, and that which has an end may be brought to an end. He has no name, for everything which has a name is kindred to things created. Form he has none, nor yet any union of members, for whatsoever possesses these is kindred to things fashioned. He is neither male nor female. The heavens do not limit him, but the heavens and all things, visible and invisible, receive their bounds from him. Adversary he has none, for there exists not any stronger than he. Wrath and indignation he possesses not, for there is nothing which is able to stand against him. Ignorance and forgetfulness are not in his nature, for he is altogether wisdom and understanding, and in him stands fast all that exists. He requires not sacrifice and libation, nor even one of things visible. He requires not anything from anyone, but all living creatures stand in need of him. I would like to begin with my conclusions about the letter of Barnabas. It is my opinion that the letter of Barnabas was written around 130 AD by a Barnabas in Alexandria. However, this video will also include the support for Barnabas the Apostle having been the author. The letter of Barnabas is one of the three works that were almost included in the New Testament canon. The other two were First Clement and the Shepherd of Hermas. Since there is a debate over whether this letter is scripture or not, this video will share much more detail about the work. This letter bears the name of Barnabas, not within the letter itself, but in the title of the ancient copies we have. Was the letter written by Barnabas, who was an apostle according to Acts 4.36 and 14.14? Clement of Alexandria believed so, and called him an apostle four times. He also quoted the letter of Barnabas about eight times. Now, if you are familiar with Clement of Alexandria, this is not surprising. Far more than any other pre-Nicene Christian writer, Clement was very quick to accept various books as scripture. Clement of Alexandria had a very open mind. One might even consider him a little naive. What about other pre-Nicene writers? Tertullian mentions both Barnabas and the letter of Barnabas. He says, Barnabas was a man sufficiently accredited by God as being one whom Paul had placed next to himself in the uninterrupted observance of abstinence. Paul wrote, Or do not we, I alone and Barnabas, have the power of working? And of course, the letter of Barnabas is more generally received among the churches than that apocryphal shepherd of adulterers. 
Tertullian doesn't say explicitly, but he implies that the letter of Barnabas was written by Barnabas the Apostle. About the letter of Barnabas itself, Tertullian doesn't give us any more information. No other pre-Nicene writer quotes from or even mentions the letter of Barnabas. Eusebius, who wrote soon after the Council of Nicaea, included the letter of Barnabas in the disputed or rejected books. On the other hand, Jerome, Eusebius's son, believed it was written by Barnabas the Apostle. Because the work appears to have initially become popular in Alexandria, because Clement of Alexandria was the first to refer to the letter, many scholars believe it was written in Alexandria. If this is true, then the author was probably not Barnabas the Apostle. Because of the letter's possible proximity to Alexandria, this other Barnabas has been given the name Barnabas of Alexandria, or Pseudo-Barnabas. Barnabas's Old Testament quotations are very odd. Unlike most pre-Nicene writers, many of his quotations do not follow scripture word for word. He also quotes some passages that are not found in any known scripture. This does not seem like something Barnabas the Apostle would do. This will be discussed in more detail later. This work was written by a Barnabas, but the question remains, which one? Because of this controversy as to the author, the letter of Barnabas was not considered scripture. Perhaps studying the letter from other angles will shed more light on this. The best way to determine the author and date of a book is to look at the internal evidence. As for the author, there is no internal evidence as to who Barnabas is, but there is some internal evidence for the date. The letter reads, Therefore he, the Lord, has circumcised our ears, that we might hear his word and believe. For the circumcision in which they, the Jews, trusted, is abolished. Is Barnabas talking about circumcision being abolished under the New Testament? This might be more likely, but Barnabas could be referring to the abolition of circumcision under the Roman Empire. Emperor Hadrian abolished circumcision, calling it barbaric, around 130 AD, which contributed to the Third Roman-Jewish War, also called the Bar Kokhba Revolt, about two years later. Could Barnabas be referring to this abolition of circumcision? If so, the letter of Barnabas would have been written soon after 130 AD. Some scholars date the letter as early as 96 to 98 AD, but even this is too late for it to be authored by Barnabas, the apostle, who, according to tradition, died around 60 AD. In fact, the author says that the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD, happened before his letter. I will also tell you concerning the temple, how the wretched Jews, wandering in error, trusted not in God himself, but in the temple, as being the house of God. For almost after the manner of the Gentiles, they worshipped him in the temple. But learn how the Lord speaks when abolishing it. Behold, they have cast down this temple, even they shall build it up again. It has happened. The temple was built again by Hadrian around 130 AD, so it is possible that the letter was written after 130 AD. And the letter was certainly written after the temple's destruction in 70 AD. Unless Barnabas the Apostle lived into the 70s, this letter could not have been written by him though it seems more likely that the letter was written in the second century, the work was written very, very early in Christian history. But the question remains, when exactly? After spending over ten hours researching the author and date, it is my opinion that the letter of Barnabas was written by a Barnabas of Alexandria around or after 130 AD. What about the content? Barnabas is quite insightful and reveals some obscure patterns between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Perhaps he even reads too deeply into the scriptures, drawing meanings that may not have been intended. In this first example, Barnabas gives a reason why Moses commanded the Israelites not to eat swine. For this reason, he, Moses, named the swine, as much as to say, You shall not join yourself to men who resemble swine. For when they live in pleasure, they forget their Lord. But when they come to want, they acknowledge the Lord. And the swine, when it has eaten, 
does not recognize its master. But when hungry, it cries out, and on receiving food, is quiet again. Second, Barnabas gives a reason why Moses commanded the Israelites not to eat certain birds. He, Moses, says, Neither shall you eat the eagle, the hawk, the kite, nor the raven. He means, You shall not join yourself to such men who do not know how to obtain food for themselves by labor and sweat, but seize the things of others in their sins, and although wearing an aspect of simplicity, are on the watch to plunder others. So these birds, while they sit idle, inquire how they may devour the flesh of others, proving themselves pests by their wickedness. As mentioned before, Barnabas' use of scripture is not word for word. I have taken all of his quotes of scripture and put them into four categories. Direct quotes, slightly different quotes, very different quotes, and quotes that are not found in any religious document known to either Jews or Christians. To be fair to the author, it does not look like he intended to write exact quotations. For example, in chapter 6, Barnabas quotes Genesis 1.28 twice, but he does not quote it the same way both times. It seems that he is often quoting scripture from memory. So it is easy to show mercy regarding the verses that are slightly different. However, the proportion of quotations that are very different or not even found in scripture is unreasonably high if the letter of Barnabas itself is to be considered scripture. Because of these two categories, the letter does not seem like the work of Barnabas the Apostle, who had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the verses that is very different from Scripture is from Exodus 20 verse 8, about keeping the Sabbath holy. It is written concerning the Sabbath in the Decalogue, which the Lord spoke face to face to Moses on Mount Sinai, and sanctify the Sabbath of the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart. Not only is Barnabas's quotation very different as he adds a completely new phrase at the end, but this is one of the Ten Commandments, and he is aware of this. To quote one of the Ten Commandments so differently suggests that Barnabas the Apostle is not the author. Of the quotes not found in Scripture, one of these quotations is attributed to Jesus. He, Jesus, says, Those who wish to behold me and lay hold of my kingdom must obtain me through tribulation and suffering. This sounds like something Jesus taught, but these words are not found in our scriptures. There are three big reasons why I do not believe this work was written by Barnabas the Apostle. There are four errors in this letter. First, Barnabas spends much time on an Old Testament command regarding the goat that was to be sent out into the wilderness. This is found in Leviticus 16, 7-10, where Aaron is instructed to take the goat of the Lord and sacrifice it as a burnt offering. A man was to lead the other goat out into the wilderness for Azazel. However, Barnabas says that before the goat was led into the wilderness, the people spat on it, pierced it, and wrapped its head in red wool. This is not mentioned in scripture or in any Jewish writing we have today. Scholars believe this was a Jewish custom of the first century, but we don't know for sure. In any case, Barnabas explains this treatment of the goat as if Moses commanded it, which Moses did not. Second, Barnabas says this about the hyena. Moreover, you shall not eat the hyena. He, Moses, means, you shall not be an adulterer, a corrupter, nor be like them that are such. Why? because that animal annually changes its sex, and is at one time male and at another female. Modern science has concluded that hyenas do not change sex, but it is admitted that a hyena's genitals are very difficult to distinguish. Was there a hyena in Barnabas's day that changed sex from year to year? Perhaps, but there is no evidence to this at all. Third, Barnabas says this about the weasel. Moreover, he... Moses, has rightly detested the weasel, for he means, You shall not be like those whom we hear of that commit wickedness with the mouth on account of their uncleanness, nor shall you be joined to those impure women who commit iniquity with the mouth, for this animal conceives by the mouth. The belief that weasels conceive through their mouths is a myth dating back many centuries. 
One of the earliest references to this idea is in the book The Metamorphosis by the Roman poet Ovid in 8 AD. In it, the mortal Galanthus defied some of the gods by allowing Hercules to be born. In retaliation, she was turned into a weasel. In the early 7th century, Isidore, Archbishop of Seville, Spain, stated that this belief about the weasel was false. However, this myth became very popular during the late Middle Ages, where it developed further into the belief that weasels also give birth through their mouths. Fourth, Barnabas uses a few Hebrew letters and denotes their numeric equivalents. Scripture says, As Abraham circumcised ten and eight and three hundred men of his household, what then was the knowledge given to him in this? Learn the eighteen first, and then the three hundred. The ten and the eight are thus denoted, ten by I and eight by H. You have the initials of the name of Jesus. And because the cross was to express the grace of our redemption by the letter T, he says also, 300. He signifies, therefore, Jesus by two letters and the cross by one. When he says, I, Yod, is ten, and H, Heth, is eight, he is correct. When he says these are the initials of the name of Jesus, Yeshua, he is correct. However, T, Tav, is not 300, but 400. The letter S, Shin, is 300. So in Barnabas' explanation, if we were to take the letter T, we would get 418, not 318. If we were to take the letter S, we would not get the symbol of the cross. Though Barnabas' effort to tie Abraham's circumcision of his 318 servants is insightful, it is not completely accurate. In conclusion, was the letter of Barnabas written by Barnabas the Apostle? It appears that this is not the case. Does the letter of Barnabas have value for the church? It certainly does. It takes extra effort to follow Barnabas of Alexandria's very unique mind and the mysteries he reveals. But the letter of Barnabas is worth the read.